Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great guest tonight. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I do want to tell you uh, a number of people have written me um, asking me how Alejandro Rojas is. He's doing fine, just uh, to let everyone know. He's just been really busy, a lot of changes going on, but he is doing absolutely fine. He was actually going to be on the show this evening, and uh, he is traveling for Thanksgiving. And speaking of that, um, I want to wish everyone out there a happy Thanksgiving, and if you celebrate here in America, uh, it's a wonderful holiday, I think. Families get together, uh, eat turkey, and hopefully do not talk about politics and just have a really good visit with each other. And um, our guest tonight, I'm real excited, Bryce Zabel. Uh, we had a little brief interview with him out in Phoenix a few years ago. Um, tonight, we got him for the whole show, so I'm pretty excited about that. And what a background he has. We'll talk about that. But in the film industry, he is uh, an incredible, an incredible background and uh, has uh, written a lot of wonderful things. And he has a lot of things on his plate at all times. A very active guy and a lot of fun. <clears throat> Welcome to the show, Bryce. It's great to be with you, Martin. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, let's see. You, you, like I said, you have so much going on all the time oh. out there. And, <laughs> and, you're, and you're having fun. I remember you and I had a conversation, and you mentioned yeah. something along the lines of your wife saying, hey, you know, you could do as a good a job as uh, someone else on this. Why don't you see if you can write uh, a screenplay, right? Oh, Isn't that how that as started? That's how I got started. It. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say, my wife said, you could do as good a job as that, Martin. Why don't you just do a podcast? <laughs> uh, no, uh, which well, I could not do. I could not do as good a job as you, so oh, forget no, no. that. Yeah. No, but that actually is what happened uh, uh, years ago. Uh, when I first came to L.A., I was uh, the CNN correspondent. And uh, as things go on, shows get canceled. Uh, the guy that hired me got fired. I ended up having to look for work. And, uh, and that's when I realized, well, you know, I could be like one of these itinerant news guys just blowing from town to town. And, and uh, who knows what that life would have been like. But my wife said, well, maybe you should try writing a screenplay. And I'd never written a screenplay before. I said, I don't even know what it looks like. It wasn't like there was an internet to look at it on. This is how long ago it was. And, um, but I got a hold of one on Hollywood Boulevard, looked at it, thought doesn't have a lot of adjectives and adverbs in it, kind of like TV news. Probably can do that. That's what I did. Ah, wow. <laughs> wow. Someone just said, I look haggard. I need a vacation. That was a nice message to get. Thanks, I don't know Phil. if they were they talking about because somebody else, uh, I saw the first comment on the thing was something about, did the guy have facial surgery or is that Photoshop? I presume they're talking about me, and it is an older photo, so there yeah. is that. Well, there is but, a reason uh, I do a podcast that's audio. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I'm happy to be here, and in fact, I was thrilled. Uh, I'm trying a new little light on, and... That my light over there seems to be shining properly. All is good with the world. Let's talk. That's right. That's right. And you're out in uh, you're out in fire country out there. Uh, how I, how's, I am. I, how's that been this year? Uh, well, I sort of sell. Well, to back up, last year it wasn't good at all. Last year uh, I I was evacuated. I remember that. Uh, yeah. The fires were blowing through my town on the way in uh, down to Malibu. Um, many of my friends were affected. It, it was a, a, a terrible and, and horrible situation. Uh, this year, I'd actually gone to Phoenix for a couple of days uh, to visit my daughter. And, and while I was there, uh, that we started getting all these fire warnings. So I just stayed another week. So I, I call it a self evacuation. As it turns out, the fires didn't burn through here, uh, but they could. And, um, you know, it's just not a Southern California problem though anymore. Now we're having, uh, fires everywhere. Um, right. in, in a few weeks, I'm going to be doing some traveling and, and, and I'll be going to Australia among uh, other places. And, you know, Australia is on fire, right? Right. Now. So it's serious, uh, mm. this kind of stuff happens. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, happy to hear that our weather forecast says it's going to rain for Thanksgiving. And that's not usually something that you get excited about, but down here it is. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Uh, it's, it's doesn't seem like it's going to be getting any better anytime soon. I, uh, you know, I moved out of, uh, California in 2010, or 2011 in uh, Northern California, but still they're even, you know, they're 
they're threatened up. That's them, uh, up well, there. Well, that's too. where paradise happened last you know, that's year, right. and that was yeah. horrible. I mean, uh, no, uh, it, it's going to be with us for a while, but we have to change. Uh, certainly, uh, we have changed some of our habits. I'll tell you one of the things we did just. Uh, Right immediately after we were evacuated last year, uh, my wife and I each bought a, a, a top-level uh, scanner that could scan photos fast and uh, documents, and we just started scanning our office and our lives up because the, the most horrible thing about the evacuation last year was we hadn't done any of that. Mm -hmm. We didn't know where anything was, and you know, you get five minutes to get out, yeah. and uh, there's not really time to grab but a... Uh, photo album or two and i just didn't want this year if i lost my house i didn't want to lose my memories so yeah. uh we scanned up a bunch of stuff and we're better also you have a suitcase ready to go uh when the time comes yeah uh you have your cars full of gas uh mm -hmm. in case you need to go yeah. so you know we start to do that but a lot of us here uh where i'm living you know we have multiple things to worry about we have the earthquake to worry about yeah. Uh, we have fires to worry about. We have floods to worry about when it rains after the fires. And yet it's still, and yet sometimes it feels like paradise here. So, oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's and a, the good. Yeah. When the weather's beautiful out there, you just can't beat it. It's just, a, it's yeah. just nothing like it. But anyway, um, I want you to, you, you did a series. Uh, we talked about it in the last time briefly, but uh, Dark Skies, that was, uh, that was a real interesting one. Uh, can you tell how you got involved in that? Well, you know, it's it's funny. Um, I look, it was the greatest uh, creative experience of my career. I really, really enjoyed it. It was obviously the most uh, important UFO project that that I've done. Although I've talked about it a, a lot over the years, um, but my my partner on that, Brent Friedman, and I, uh, literally at the time we created that, which now is over two decades in the past. So it's not like a contemporary credit, but it, it sort of has like a good wine. It's even improved with age because it was prescient about a, a, a few things that uh, needed to be talked about. But what Brent and I thought at the time, because I was just really starting to bring my uh, my game up on the topic of UFOs. So I knew enough to be dangerous, but I also knew a lot about the Kennedy assassination. Um, and we thought, well, these are the two great uh, conspiracy theories of our our time. What if we put them in an atom collider and let them go boom and see what happens? So we made a television series that, in essence, is all about John Kennedy being killed because he was going to tell the truth about UFOs in his second term, which is one of the craziest things to get on television on a broadcast network back then, and yet we did it. Um, and at the time that we did it, we thought it was pretty much an original uh, idea. Now you, you read more and more about it, partly because we encouraged it into the zeitgeist, but I think there were other, I think Behold a Pale, Pale Horse, that, that book, mentioned it. I, I didn't know it at the time, but I've since seen it. Anyway, so uh, t t apropos of some of the things we might want to talk about today, I, because I think it's really an important way to look at the UFO question, what we decided to ask ourselves is, okay, let's go back to 1947. Uh, we know that Kenneth Arnold pretty much saw what he saw, but could have been anything. Do we believe Roswell? Do we believe that Roswell was an event that uh, included the crash of something that was not made by the United States or the Soviet Union. And we thought, we do believe that. So then we, we sort of jumped ahead and said, if that was true, and we believe it is, then the fact that we weren't talking about it in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s or the 80s means that somebody else was talking about it. And we thought, let's shine the light on the people who would be talking about that in the 1960s. So we built a series around Majestic 12 um, and, uh, you know, with Roswell as the source that informed it all. And that's kind of the birth wow. of Dark Skies. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Well, you think about it, um, you know, no one really talked about Roswell, um, you know, shortly after it happened. And then all right. the way up until, you know, Stan Friedman kind of cracked it open again when he spoke with, um, who am I thinking Jesse of? Jesse Marcel. Yeah. Jesse Marcel. Right. Well, in fact, you know, um, uh, 
first of all, um, shout out to Stan Friedman, who's yeah. uh, left us this year. Yeah. Uh, tremendous uh, influence in ufology. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Um, I literally uh, optioned Stan's book back during Dark Skies, his top secret magic book. And I wasn't able to set it up at the time, but I revisited it um, a, a few years back and re-optioned it, plus his life rights, plus uh, Don huh. Schmidt's life rights, huh. plus Don Schmidt's book, Witness to Roswell, and sort of did the old atom collider thing again and put them into an atom collider and to tell a story about the race to break the Roswell story. And I got to know Stanton uh, quite well. And uh, here, uh, you know, he... Uh, for those people who have heard him speak on the circuit, after a while, you sort of, you know, you got the stand stories down. But what was great for me is I was able to sit him in a chair and, like, pin him down for over 30 hours of talks. <laughs> oh, where wow. he'd start to tell me one of the stories that you might hear yeah. in the lecture, and I'd go, yeah, I know that story, but... And then I would take him back to something else. And I really got to know him uh, on a personal level and also... Um, uh, some of his professional thoughts that didn't as often get widely shared. And I, I, I really enjoyed that relationship. That movie is still alive. Uh, we're trying to find a, a way to get it. It's just, you know what? It's just hard to make make anything. Even though there's more production going on, it's hard. And the UFO topic has its own set of rules here in Hollywood, just like you know, you'd imagine some people are able from time to time to pierce that veil. I hope to be one of them on some of these projects you mentioned, but it's not always easy and it's not always a straight line. So what do you envision something with uh, Stan Friedman's uh, information? What are you envisioning on creating? Is it something you said you put it in with Don Schmidt's work yeah. and all that. Uh, uh, here's what I thought that was so in- intriguing. I r- sort of stumbled across this, uh, you know, in, in, during my travels, if you will. The, I, I'd been reading all the stuff that Stan and Don had published over the years. And what was interesting to me, in the 90s, these guys were in basically a shooting war with each other. I mean, Stan would publish an article and Don would snipe at it. And then <laughs> Stan would snipe at Don's article. And people were picking sides and everything. And I just thought, well, that's that's kind of intriguing because it's probably hard enough to prove that UFOs are real. And then when you have to fight each other, uh, that just is doubling down on the difficulty factor, which I think is still true of ufology today. I mean, absolutely. The, 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 the mere talk, you know, bring up Tom DeLonge, you'll get pros and cons, that oh, yeah. kind of thing. So uh, here's the thing that just made me as a writer, though, respond to it. It turns out that, uh, and I don't know the exact year, I think it might have been 94, but one of the funding sources uh, that uh, Stan and Don had each gone to to help fund their research trips to Roswell to talk to uh, uh, and interview witnesses, this funding group said, well, we'll fund another trip, but you guys need to work together. And so Stan and Don took this legendary trip to interview Roswell witnesses in the 90s, even when they were busy in the public sphere attacking each other as 'er ne'er-do-wells who didn't know anything about anything. So I just thought it was very funny. It's like the, it's like, uh, I I thought it was the spoonful of sugar way to tell the Roswell story, to to sort of deflect uh, and let people focus on the charm of the two characters having to share a motel when they (laughs) basically are fighting and, you know, and, and, you know, Don always comes across as the guy with the, the beautifully, the, the, the nice suit with his tie, perfectly tied, and Stan looks a little disheveled, right? Yeah. So you can imagine in the hotel room what that might have been like. So anyway, built that around that, and that uh, project, which is uh, had to be retitled, is now called The Crash, and we are actively trying to get that made. So, wow. yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. That'll be exciting if you, if you do that. Well, point. you know, I, I almost, here's the thing, we talked about it before we went on, I, it's, part of me wants to tell everybody about these things that I'm working on, because, you know, I'm a writer, producer, and I get excited, and I want to talk about the things that excite me, the things I'm working on, the things I'm writing about. But then the other part is, nothing ever happens, right? <laughs> this is Hollywood. It's, yeah. it's hard to raise money. Sure. Uh, it's hard to make a film about UFOs, because the people who might give you the money 
have their own way of looking at it. And they may not look at it the same way you look at it. So it gets really hard. And I don't like to go on your show and talk about something. And then, you know, I, I always get this because I'm sure it'll happen again today. We're talking about it right now. And somebody will write me an email saying, now, um, where, what theaters can I see your movie in right now? And, uh, well, basically the answer is you can't. Yeah. Uh, the movie's not made. We're trying to get it made. And believe me, when it is made, uh, I'll probably come to your house and tell you what theater <laughs> you can watch it in. Well, there's a lot of moving parts to these type of things when it comes to anything Absolutely. like that, as you know. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done several uh, screen tests and, and uh, have been involved in some pictures for, you know, in the antiques world, not in the, uh, in the UFO world. But uh, for different shows, and you know, they may even make a pilot. But to actually get something launched and going, there's a that's a that's a long process, you know, but, and very listen, few uh, make uh, it too. It's yeah. it's it's very true. Although uh, here's the interesting thing, um, I've been lucky. I've uh, had five uh, primetime series that I created get on the air. That's amazing, um, and yeah. they all happened relatively fast on top of each other. And I got to the place where I thought, wow, this is great. So you just write a script. <laughs> And they make a television series about it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that was just sort of my early run of luck. And then you run into the real world again, yeah. you know, and, and you, you know, you go, f it's all percentages. Um, you know, many, many writers have written dozens, if not a hundred pilots in their lives, you know, and, and never had any of them made That's or right. they had them made, yeah. but they didn't get ordered to series. Now, um, I also have kind of another life. I was the chairman of the uh, Television Academy, the people that give out the Emmy Awards for right. uh, a couple of years, uh, notably during 9-11 when we had to cancel them. But the interesting thing is television is exploding exponentially. There were 11,000 members when I ran the organization and was at CEO back in 2003, and now there are 25,000. Wow. All right, so that's a pretty explosive growth. Um, the amount of television series just a, you know, not not even quite a decade ago was something like 200 plus, and now it's like 478 or some number like that. So we're we're in an explosion of of material that's being made, and yet uh, you would you would think that it would make it easy to get other new material and other ideas in there, but it's actually not that way because they the streaming services. There is no streaming service that wants to say, yeah, bring us the stuff that Netflix wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody mm -hmm. feels like that. They're like, hey, we only want to hear from you if you've got a top actor attached or something like that. So it's just as hard as it ever was. But the difference is even more people are playing in the game. So right. I don't know. Right. I don't know what that means for all of us um, other than. Um, I'm I'm trying to use the sheer numbers and the fact I've been doing this for a few years to get a few UFO themed um, projects, you know, out there because I think the time. I mean, we'll probably talk about this, but the time could never be better to try to bring a few fact-based alien pieces because, uh, you know, not everything has to be an alien invasion. Not everything has to be an alien on board a spacecraft that's eating people one by one. Sometimes there are great cases, like the Roswell case, that should be explored properly. And another uh, thing I have under option is the Captured book, also by Stan Friedman, but with Kathy Marden, right. which is about the and Barney Hill, mm -hmm. which I I really think, um, I, I hope to get lucky soon with that, because I just think there's just not a better case. It's, right. the, it's all about the first. It's the first people that claimed abduction here in the United States. It's the first people that had missing time. It's the first people that got hypnotized. I mean, it's a great case. And all that, and they're dealing with racism and an interracial marriage. So That's right. It's got it all. So. Uh, another thing you mentioned, um, and just about uh, two and a half minutes, we have to go to break here, but another thing you mentioned is, uh, you know, the different ways to get things out there. And there's so many ways to get something out there you you look back you know years ago when we you and i were both young there was like five channels and then so many people watching those five channels and now it's spread out i mean our population's higher yes and all that um but everything is spread out you have less viewership um with so oh, much going oh, on and so many ways to access let's cycle that back to the dark skies scenario 
the numbers, the ratings that Dark Skies had on a Saturday night where we basically got no promotion and we kept getting preempted and things like that. Yet the numbers that we had there would have made us a super hit on almost any streaming <laughs> service right now. We right. were, we were not, I don't, I can't remember if we won our time slot. We did a few times, but the numbers that used to exist in a three network universe, uh, were huge. And now, mm -hmm. uh, you can have a hit, you know, every, most of your friends probably have heard of Breaking Bad, but I guarantee you not everyone has. There's lots of people that would go, yeah, I don't, I don't, I never heard, I, maybe I heard something about that. So we've lost the ability that we used to have when there were three networks where literally you go to work the next day and everybody would say, did you see that Gilligan's Island? Man, yeah. was that funny. Well, yeah. we don't have that anymore. Now you can watch the funniest damn thing that was ever created in the history of television, and nobody yeah. will have seen it. Unless they're talking about it on Reddit. <laughs> yes. Or you know what well, I mean? Then, Something like that. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes and, you know, all, all that type of thing. It all has a, it all has a play in here. Of course. And, yeah. I, I think I'm going to go to break early since we're kind of pausing at this point. So um, we will be back in a few minutes, everyone. So hang in there. And uh, we will be right back right after these messages. Race. <laughs> Race, are you there? I got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Race, come back to us. Earth to race, Earth to race. Please come in. Okay. <laughs> you know when I double mute my mic, I need to, I need to make sure I remember I do it. Okay, <laughs> guys, we've got three minutes in this break. Okay, excellent. So um, let's see. In the three minutes, we'll talk about. Well, we we really, um, you know, we really are not staying on or going back to any topic that we were talking about um, previously. But we'll we'll in the three minutes that we do have here, um, let's. Let's uh, talk about UFO sightings in your area. Do you are you aware of any in particular? Uh, uh, current sightings, um, or just in historical? No. I mean, how long have you lived there? Actually, I've mm -hmm. lived uh, out in Southern California for almost thirty years now, and and you know, his historically, Los Angeles, Southern California has been uh, has had more than its share of really intriguing sightings, and um, you know. But I'll tell you something, Martin. What's really in intrigued me is because people know me as the UFO guy in my <laughs> circle, right? Uh -huh. So people know that if they talk to me about certain things, I won't laugh at them because how could I? I I'm writing about these things and all that. So I've had people over the years tell me interesting stories. Here's one that uh, comes from my plumber. Uh, he was working on a sink, and he said... Uh, so uh, you're the guy that did that Dark Sky show. I said, yeah. And he said, you know, when I was like uh, 10 years old, 12 years old, uh, he was going to school on Wilshire, uh, elementary school on Wilshire here in the middle of Los Angeles. And he said on a, on a break, over 200 kids saw a metallic, cylindrical, wingless craft, uh, you know, maybe 500 feet up hovering over the playground the teachers all saw it the kids all saw it he went home that night and he told his parents and they said well that'll be great we'll read about it in the paper tomorrow well the next morning came it wasn't in the paper and you know what his parents told him they said never talk to anybody about this they'll think uh, you're weird uh, right uh, so yeah. that's what happens with a lot of great cases right and yet that was a story where i mean i think if that happened today that it wouldn't be buried quite like that. I think it, because more people would be posting on social media about it. But right. here's a really yeah. great sighting, a really thing, it gone away. Answer your question, though, I don't spend a lot of time keeping up on the latest particular sightings because I'm not essentially a researcher. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I, 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 I have opinions, but, but I don't do a lot of original research. I do a lot of uh, reading, a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of writing, but you know, not so much going out in the field and talking to anybody about anything. I probably should. I, I'm sure it's fun. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't do I don't do any of that myself either. You know, to speak of, but I love to hear uh, you talk about your plumber. I love to hear stories from people like that. 
you know, someone that is not involved in the UFO field. Uh, Ray, are we going back in? Should be five yes, minutes. Yes, sir. We're ready to go whenever you are. We are ready here. Well, I've got five seconds here, and then I can count you down. All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. In five, four, three, two. All right. Welcome back. My guest tonight is Bryce Zabel, and uh, we are talking UFOs, et cetera, films and all that. And uh, we were sort of, uh, you know, basically toward the end of the conversation before the break, we were talking about, you know, how difficult it is to, you know, get something launched when it comes to filmmaking and all that. There's uh, and, and it's hard to sell, too. I mean, you have to almost don't you almost have to even if you get, um, you know, producers that'll, that'll back you, don't you have to ha almost have to have something pre-sold or an idea which how are you going to market it eventually, or do you just I, go with I, it? You know what? <clears throat> My experience is just there's a thousand ways to sell something, right? And uh, uh, so I would never tell anyone there's a right way or a wrong way to do it. I will say <clears throat> that like, like a lot of businesses where there's a lot of money on the line, people are risk-averse. Right. So the less money you spend on the project, the more they're willing to probably let you freelance a little bit. The more money that gets spent on the project, then people want to know, is this going to work? Am I going to get some of my money back? Right. So that does uh, cause people to look at a project through different eyes. In other words, I don't think there's too many people running around Hollywood that know like uh, you do and I do and your uh, your audience does about uh, what's really going on in the in the ufology situation right now they don't really know about the only thing they know about tom DeLong is he is blink 182 the you know they've heard basically maybe there was maybe they heard tucker carlson talk about it or whatever but they're not they're not really dialed into it that's um, right I, I agree. And, and so yeah. what i in anytime i'm in somebody's office talking about ufos the first hurdle i have to always uh, get over is somebody will just go so you you really believe in this UFO stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a hell of a beginning because <laughs> what it means is I'm not only there to pitch this story, but I have to overcome their objection to even thinking that it's because they think it's just a science fiction piece. So from their point of view, you know, you could pitch and this has happened. I, you could pitch, uh, I don't know. I mean, you could pitch the, as we talked about the Roswell story or Betty and Barney and get a note from somebody saying, well, does Barney have to be black? Well, mm. yeah. I mean, cause he was right. So you just have people that look at it like just a story. That's a malleable story, right? Mm -hmm. Where we know, and your audience knows this is the real deal. Something has been going on probably for thousands of years. All right. But for sure, with some relative intensity since the 40s. Yeah. And for reasons that are still a little obscure, it's managed to be covered up or deflected from the public sphere of, of discussion all these years. And so now we sit in this netherworld where if you really pay a lot of attention to the topic, you know damn well something's going on. Yeah. I mean, something is going on. Period. All right. We know this. But if you go outside and go talk to the people, you know, at your local grocery store, they probably don't really think about it like you do. Here it is, the most transformational thing that could ever enter into your brain and blow your mind. And we don't talk about it. It's yeah. unbelievable. Lots of people are going to go to Thanksgiving dinner in from the time that we're talking right now in a couple of days. And you know what? Uh, it won't even come up for most people, all right? I mean, for most discussion, nobody will discuss the fact that we're not alone, and the evidence is they're not out there, but they're here interacting mm -hmm. with us right now. But we don't talk about that. Now, how crazy is that? And if you dare to talk about it at your Thanksgiving dinner this year, I guarantee you your chances are at least 60% you will be treated like the drunk uncle at a wedding. <laughs> You know, the guy that's had yeah. that extra too many glasses of champagne and needs to sit down. Yeah. And I find this to be the craziest thing that I've ever encountered in my life. And I, I think as I get older, I get more frustrated by it because I would like to believe 
that we at least are going to publicly own up to this in my lifetime. I don't think that's too much to ask. You know, I think that the idea that we could all sort of acknowledge that it's real and then start talking about what to do about it, I don't know why that's so radical. That seems like a pretty pragmatic thing to do. Now, I guess you could argue, well, the truth may be so freaking unbelievable and so disturbing that we don't dare talk to people about it, but I reject that. I mean, the truth is, um, if the truth is got a little blackness over it, it's still the truth. Yeah. So, you know, we, we don't really have the option, I think, of waiting any longer. The planet is in disarray politically. Uh, the, the climate is changing in a way that's very problematic for our own survival even. And if, if indeed there are uh, other intelligences interacting with us, I think we better get on with that one too. Yeah. Uh, last week I had... Uh uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bennett, um, uh, astrophysicist on, and uh, a good part of his talk was about climate change. And uh, the reason I'm just bringing that up, you just mentioned it, but I have to tell you, I don't believe there's ever been a time where I've gotten more email about that topic than uh, yeah. I, than I have about you know <clears throat> UFOs. And mostly, you know, people are. Uh, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of people that are um, that don't want to look at it. I'll just put it that way, you know. It's, are you uh, talking about climate change yes. right now? Uh-huh. Well, you know, there are there are similarities between climate change and UFOs. Well, I mean, tell me about that because someone that, asked me about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, and again, I don't, I don't wish to incite public political violence on your show or anything, <laughs> but let's just let's just make it as basic as we can. You take climate change. You take UFOs. The similarity between these two issues is that they, the evidence appears to say that they exist, okay? <laughs> Yet, there is trouble in the public sphere discussing them. Mm-hmm. So we watch these things get more complicated and unsolvable, and we don't address them. So I do think uh, one of the things that would certainly be, be good is if um, out of whatever's going on in our world right now, that the, the idea that we want to embrace what's really happening, what truth is, would be a good thing. You know, we, if it's clear, you know, we can argue what causes climate change, but I think is not the debate already settled that it's happening. I mean, I, I, I didn't used to have to evacuate my house every year or get ready every year, and now I do. So something's happening. Uh, uh, and, and the same with UFOs. If, if you pay attention, I mean, what more do you need? The U.S. Navy says they're real. Mm-hmm. What more What more do we need? The only thing that I like about that, by the way, is that when I do start talking about it on Thanksgiving, um, I may not be treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding mm-hmm. because some of these people will say, oh, yeah, so you, you, I read something about that. What's going on? Okay, now that's where I think it's great. Yes. Because then I get to say, well, are you, were you, you now let's go back to 2017. Did you read that New York Times article? No, I didn't. Well, let me tell you what that's about. Another thing that I do, by the way, for, for people is I maintain a pretty large uh, library of UFO books. Mm-hmm. And I have duplicates of a number that I think are really good. And I'll loan them out to people. Mm-hmm. So if somebody asks me on Thanksgiving about it, I'm going to run upstairs to my collection and grab a copy of something and run it downstairs and, and give it to them and say, why don't you read this and then call me and let's discuss it. Because mm-hmm. I think we have got to get this into the public sphere one way or the other. And the you know change tends to be not top down. It isn't going to be probably the head of the Pentagon announcing it. We're going to have to, from the ground up, change the 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 situation on the ground so that the people up above feel like if we do talk about this openly we will not screw everything up i mean yeah that's how i look yeah i had uh i I mentioned this briefly on a show a while ago i spoke with um someone in my professional world uh and through antiques actually in art he was having me look at some things um that he wanted to sell and he said that he was with the uh, in the Navy for 30 years, recently retired, and he used to, um, the last job for many years, he was out in California, 
at uh, some base southern in Southern California and um, had something to do with flight control or something like that. And so I mentioned to him, you know, uh, just to see his reaction, I say, hey, did you see the, you know, Navy announced, uh, you know, that they're going to be looking into UFOs or can report UFOs? And he said, well, you know, I used to see, we used to see these things on radar that would appear and disappear and do all these unusual maneuvers. But he says, but I just thought they were experimental aircraft from the local or He mentioned some base they may have come right. from. Right. But that's all, that's, you know, that's all he, he, he just assumed that's but what they were. But you know what? And, and you know what I would say to that person? I'd say, well, you know, uh, that's probably a pretty good assumption. Uh, when you see the things flying around right now that exceed our ability to uh, comprehend how they do that, because we don't have aircraft that do those things, uh, you still might say, well, it might be secret technology that we've got, or the Russians or the Chinese. But then you say... Do you think anybody had it back in 1947? When they were doing the same thing. Do you, do you think when these yeah. things were flying around Washington, D.C. in 1952 that that somebody had that ability back then? I don't think so. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, we just have to keep keep moving ahead. I'll tell you my – are we about to go to a break? No, no, we, we have we 15, 10, 10 minutes. Here's, an, yeah. here's, here's just something that is – something that I'm kind of intrigued that we haven't done more of, which is we're in the middle of a presidential campaign. More candidates than ever before are out running around Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and Nevada, and they're all holding town halls. Mm -hmm. And they all accept questions from the audience. So for all these millions of people who actually think of themselves as UFO knowledgeable or UFO activists, why aren't they going to some of these town halls and asking questions that are respectful questions saying, are you aware that the U.S. Navy has released these three videos uh, and that the U.S. Navy now confirms that unidentified aerial phenomenon are something they're looking into and they're working on reporting procedures? <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Candidate, my question to you is, will you support congressional hearings on this topic, and will you dedicate yourself to government transparency on the topic? Why mm. do we have somebody? Why has not one person asked that in any of these town halls? And why are we not writing these, these uh, reporters who are asking questions at debates? Why aren't they asking about this? Why is the fact that there are things flying around that interfere with nuclear weapons, why is that not something that should be discussed in a presidential debate or at a town hall? I don't get it. And I'll tell you something. Uh, I have a, my own little Twitter presence or whatever, and I've noticed that when I tweet about, you know, can't wait for the truth to come out on, you know, UFO reality. And I put a nice picture with it. I get a lot of likes and, you know, and I get a lot of comments and all that. But when I say, why doesn't somebody go to a town hall and ask a candidate about UFOs? No, I don't get uh, hardly anything. So uh, I, I just go like, what I think needs to be happening right now is that UFO reality, UAP reality, has to switch and start taking in some of those public activist tactics that mm. have existed for various social issues, whether it was women's suffrage or the civil rights movement or anti-war or whatever. These are political social movements. Where are we with this UFO thing? We should be, we should be pushing forward the relatable storylines and asking our representatives why they won't investigate it and you could say well they'll never investigate it because no one will tell but that's not the point is it the point is not that the candidates will get it and not that the congressional people will understand it immediately it's that we'll force people to talk about it and it'll get into the national dialogue and the international dialogue and slowly but surely this will become something that people can talk about in open public forums that's really? what i look for yeah, really interesting. Now, I remember Hillary Clinton was actually in New Hampshire um, yeah. for the two, 2016. Uh, she was campaigning there and was 
I don't know if you heard, but she was asked by a reporter the very thing you're talking about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, well, I, fact, I actually had him on the show uh, briefly um, right after that. But yeah. The 2016 campaign was vastly better for UAP reality disclosure yeah. issues because you had Hillary Clinton Podesta. saying, I'll talk about it. Yep. And all and Podesta. And, and this has been a disappointing year when there's more going on than ever, more things to discuss. And, you know, the Democratic debates are plowing the territory of Medicare for all ad nauseum. And I'm not saying that's not an important issue. It certainly is an important issue what health care people are going to have. But I would also think if we're worried about safety and security and health care, I think if somebody can turn off a nuclear weapon at will, yeah. uh, that's a safety issue. I don't know why we're not looking into it. So well, just to, I, I hats off to yeah. any of those. Like Mark Walker, I guess, a uh, Republican congressman, has been active in trying to push for those kind of things. I think it's it's smart. We need to do that. Yeah. Well, there's also, you know, think of O'Hare or any of the possible, you know, encounters when, when uh, commercial Absolutely. or, you know, uh, planes are involved. And there's, uh, you know, sky safety, you know, for one. And, and uh, it's baffling course. why that's not taken more seriously, you know, right there. It's, But see, I, I think, though, that that's, that's the essence of it. The way in to the barn, the way to get your head into that barn is through air safety and nuclear weapon security. Hmm. Those are the issues that you can ask about in a public forum and say, are you, you know, I'm not, and you can literally, you can say, look, I'm not saying they're from another planet, but I'm saying that the U.S. Navy says they're not ours. So, Mr. or Mrs. Presidential Candidate, what do you think about it? I mean, and, you know, to this date, you know, we at least had Hillary Clinton in 2016 talking about it. This year, to the best of my knowledge, we have Andrew Yang saying something casual at a refrigerator in a New Hampshire uh, newspaper office and maybe somebody else and I can't remember who that was and just casual comments so I don't know so there that's my soapbox but again it's boring apparently because nobody thinks we should do those things but I do I think it's a political issue now I think we are moving rapidly into uh, what Richard Dolan and I wrote about in our book AD after disclosure where we said it's it, you know it's it's not going to be a, a clean line it's going to have ups and downs and starts and stops, and uh, it's going to be a little bit messy, uh, but we need to get on with it. I always quote uh, Dr. Strangelove, where uh, the general says uh, about, he's talking about nuclear war, but I always uh, think it applies to disclosure. Uh, it's General Buck Turgidson, and he's talking about nuclear war, and he says, I ain't saying we're not going to get our hair must. okay? <laughs> and that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's the true statement we can make about what disclosure is going to look like but it does us no good to wait waiting serves mm. nobody at this point i do think um it's a little uh dicey that donald trump might become the disclosure president uh because he's just very unpredictable obviously and i'm not trying to get in a political debate with anybody about anything just saying that'll be a dicey thing when that happens but it really I think the issue is so large that it transcends the political uh, occupants of the White House. It's just one we have to get on with. The world mm -hmm. has to get on with it. And frankly, if the U.S. can't get its act together to start talking about this openly, then I'm all in favor of France or, or Brazil or Russia or China getting the ball rolling. You know, mm -hmm. Let the Pope come out and start it. I don't care. Somebody needs to get this thing going. And it seems like the snowball effect, too, with something like this. And I was thinking we're on that roll, you know, ever since the New York Times article came out back in 2017. And, you know, the videos, as you mentioned earlier, and it just seemed like we were on a roll. Things were happening fast. And it's still like it little bits and pieces are happening. Like, you know, we talked about earlier, the Navy, you know, looking for ways to, to uh, have the pilots report you know, encounters and things like that. Um, so there is some type of momentum, um, you know, that is happening, but I don't, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go. And, and, and you mentioned earlier 
that uh, you're hoping in your lifetime. Um, I, I do as well. I hope that, uh, you know, we'll know more. I don't know if we'll ever, though, clearly know exactly what it is or who they are. You know, that part of it may be really uh, it, it, hard to figure look, out. Look, it, it's, uh, it's like, that, like that famous quote, the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. Mm. Right. So yeah. wh- whatever, whatever is the truth is going to be kind of mind blowing. But I would say this, um, and we said this back when I was running the TV Academy, we had this phrase that we used, which was all of us together are smarter than any one of us. Okay. Now let's think about this issue where you're saying we don't know exactly what's going on. And that's probably true. It's probably true that even people who are quote in the know aren't as in the know as they'd like to be, all right? But the way we've organized the world right now, we have very small compartmented groups of people probably talking about this and not talking in a global way to each other, but talking on very specific things. What we need is to energize the scientific, cultural, political community that humanity represents and get everybody talking to each other at once. And I wouldn't be surprised if we can come up with some pretty good theories about what's going on. And some of them may be disturbing, but, but I think if we get started, uh, it's better than not getting started. Certainly better for you and I living to see this through. Wow. You know, uh, I just had a listener just uh, text me and say that um, there was supposed to be a supposedly a ufo sighting over the white house today did you whoa i haven't <laughs> finally on the white house lawn no i haven't uh... damn it here we are talking about this and we could have been oh my god uh, well no. you know what um maybe it's going to take that maybe it will take that yeah I'll, I'll check out the news after the show but uh no i have not uh i've not heard that unfortunately uh alejandro wasn't in earlier he may have had some information about that but i have not looked uh into that, been uh, pretty preoccupied here, uh, um, up in Maine. Um, well, this is uh, this is great. Um, one of the things, uh, though, I do want to tell you that I think is kind of funny, and I mentioned this a while back, is uh, I was watching a 1950s or 60s uh, documentary um, about UFOs, and there was a guy in black and white, and and he was probably in his 50s at the time, and he's saying, I just want to you know disclosure to happen in my lifetime he didn't say disclosure but something else right and uh of course and he just thought i mean right now i feel like something's really close he felt like back then something's really close oh. you know so. yeah. you know i told you i have a good ufo library and one of the yeah. things i've done is i've collected them over the years and i started doing this pre dark skies <clears throat> but when we got into dark skies and we wanted to get the timeline together so that the show would have this internal consistency i started putting the dates on the edges of the books so and then arranging them on my shelf in the date in or the order of their publishing so over yeah. the course of time as i've read through these books you do see a trend where people going back to the 50s going back to donald kehoe when he's writing his books and he's talking about disclosure uh, is imminent. He doesn't call it disclosure. He calls it the silence group uh, that will break their silence. But people Mm -hmm. have been hoping for this change. And that's why I say we've got to also start thinking of it now that we have a little more scientific information and we can start to disclose it to ourselves. We need to move ahead scientifically and politically uh, at the same time because – Simply just dumping on the world. By the way, you know, yeah, some of those things, they're real. It's going to cause our hair getting mussed a little bit, right? So we need to have a political plan how we're going to integrate this into our society, this very high degree of uncertainty it's going to bring. Um, and and very little dis- – it's very interesting because when Dolan and I were writing AD after disclosure, we would sit around and we'd, we'd toss these ideas out to each other and – We would say to ourselves quite often, I sure as hell hope somebody else who actually knows some of the details about this is doing what we're doing right now. Because if they're not, I'm worried. I mean, we need, there's no evidence currently that anybody in the know on the inside has actually been thinking about how society is going to shift and twist and turn when this all starts to come out. And 
I, I do think, uh, I, I think there's a 50-50 chance right now that you and I will see, a, 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 and by disclosure, again, I'm not saying the president goes out and lays it all out and hands out, you know, uh, terabyte or, you know, 50 gigabytes of photos to every reporter. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But by disclosure, I mean that general sense that all of us have that something is real. Um, we can, it's okay to talk about it now. It's okay to study it and that we should have uh, transparent uh, relations uh, between government and science and uh, academia and all that and try to get to the bottom of it. And I think we are getting closer to that. That's the only hope that I can hold on to. Right, right. We go to break in about two minutes here. Um, you know, um, as far as the government, you know, I've always thought that it's possible that they may, you know, I, well, I think it's kind of obvious that they probably know more than we do because of the, you know, the many cases where uh, film was confiscated and, you know, right. situations like that. But I've always, uh, you know, I've said this on the show a number of times, I've always felt that they probably don't really know any more than we do of what it is, um, just that it is. You know, I wonder you what know, your thoughts were on that. Well, I, the two-minute version is that I, I don't think it's, it's um, effective to say what they know in the government, because I don't think there's a universal government that knows something about UFOs that's keeping that from us. I think some people know more than others. I think some people in government don't know a damn thing about it. Uh, I think it's a really mixed bag. And uh, obviously the people that know the most have the, the biggest decision to make right now. They have to make a decision for the world. Uh, they have to decide whether they're going to be on the side of transparency or whether they're not. You know, you've got to pick a side at this point and start to to come clean about what you do know, which is why, um, you know, I think all of us who have had either seen something or had something happen to us have a, a greater responsibility than ever to step forward and start to talk about it. So um, just as a tease for what we might talk later, you know, one of the things I've been uh, talking about uh, more these days is what happened to us at Dark Skies, where we were approached by people who said they were from the Office of Naval Intelligence, oh. um, not the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, my partner uh, w was friends with a member of the Reagan cabinet who told them some hair-raising stories um, about about aliens and UFOs. And, and just the sense that those of us who have heard things – we don't have to vouch for their truth or not truth. We just have to vouch for what happened to us or what we know or what we believe because we have to somehow get this topic off the podcast dedicated to UFOs, right? No, nothing wrong with your podcast. Don't get me wrong. Love your podcast. But we, we cannot ghettoize the topic into these narrow places where it's okay to talk about it. We have to do more and more of what has made us, I think, all very happy in the last two years since December of 2017, where we've seen more and more people who just don't talk about UFOs start to talk about it. That's right. And that is really great stuff. It is. Excellent. Well, all right, Bring everyone. We're ready to go on break. Uh, we'll be right back right after these messages. Hang in there. Welcome back. My guest is Bryce Zabel. And we're going to be taking calls here in a little bit. Uh, Bryce, I'm not sure I told you that I take calls on my shows. Um, you didn't tell me that. I that's didn't. good. I'm ambushing you with that. Um, I think calls are the, that's, that's accountability, my friend. <laughs> Let them, bring them on. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, we'll be doing that in about uh, 15 minutes. We'll start that. Um, but no, I think it's, it's interesting um, how we have, uh, well, you just mentioned right before we went into break, you know, uh, the last couple of years, um, you know, things have just been easier to talk about. And I think, um, um, you know, you mentioned about Thanksgiving and who knows, you know, if that topic will come up, how many homes that would, it would be really interesting to know uh, if that will come up um, because of, well, let's just say, for instance, someone's in the Navy and, you know, that it's something they're going to talk about. You know, I mean, a, a Navy pilot would uh, talk about something like this. 
you know, but uh, it'll be interesting. I, and in fact, I think they should be encouraged to do that uh, because, in fact, they're, they're not um, – most of them are, are not classified and they can't talk about it. They can talk about the topic and in many cases they can talk about the things that have actually happened to them. So they should. I mean, this is, it's, uh, this is 2020 coming up mm -hmm. and it, that's, that has the right ring to it, doesn't it? Doesn't 2020 <laughs> kind of sound like it's time to see clearly, clearly. on this issue? Yeah. yeah. So I kind of, I'm ready. I'm I'm ready to do whatever my little part will be, and and I would encourage everyone who's listening to us to think, well, what's my little part, you know? Um, and let's let's try to get this into the body politic, into the discussion that people have. Um, maybe you don't bring it up at the uh, dinner table, right? But maybe you bring it up with a like-minded friend afterwards. Um, and and and. Let's face it, Thanksgiving is a really good time to think about disclosure and contact, right? Because what is Thanksgiving? It is the contact between two dissimilar civilizations, hmm. all right? And it didn't end well for one of them, Yeah. right? <laughs> now, this time, we're, if we'd be on the other side of that. Humanity would be in the role of the Native Americans in, in mm -hmm. the Thanksgiving story and whoever these others are would be in the role of of those who came to our shores so uh i i think thanksgiving is a time to to evaluate uh where we are on this issue uh if you what do we know i i think one of the really interesting things is we we have an opportunity on this topic to actually strip away things that we suspect and things that we think and our theories, but there are enough things that we know that we can talk about now. So, for example, that Navy stuff, well, we know that. I mean, we know it. We know those things happen. We know even what the pilots said when they saw it. And we actually know, according to uh, David Fravor, uh, the pilot right now, we haven't even seen the good stuff. Right. Imagine that. Yeah. These videos are pretty revolutionary in what they are, and they're not even the good stuff. So just yeah. imagine. So this is the part that really needs to change. The, the stuff that people are recording, not, not us with our iPhones shooting at something 6,000 feet in the air, but a stuff that a pilot is shooting with the best... Uh, technology that the u.s government has we ought to be able to see that stuff and right. we're probably going to need to have congressional hearings that demand it first and we're going to be able to we need hearings that are able to call witnesses and we need hearings that are able to grant immunity and when we mm -hmm. have that on this topic things are going to start changing fast yeah that's a really good point about the immunity um Next week, I have uh, Chris Lambright on, and he's going to be talking um, a lot about um, the Nimitz, some work he's been doing on that, um, and some interesting things he brought up. But one of the things I, I mentioned to him that I thought was very puzzling is you just mentioned David Fravor. You know, yeah. there are some people that had not been, uh, had not signed a uh, non disclosure uh, like him that was actually an eyewitness. And then there's some people down the chain that had much less involvement, yet they had to sign one. That whole thing is very puzzling to me. Well, um, and, and that's where we need to start. We need, we need to start pulling these threads out and looking at them. Um, and there's a lot to look at. Uh, it, it's, it's it, in, in one respect, I, I'm, I'm sure, again, I don't want to dip my toe into something that drags us into a political morass here, but, but we have learned certain things from the impeachment stuff that's going on about sort of what we should or should not expect our representatives to be able to do and some of the rules of evidence and that are uncontested and some that aren't and various things. And, and I think uh, we need to sort of start factoring that in. We're going to have to have something similar uh, on the topic of UFOs. At some point, uh, Congress is going to start having hearings. And we already know that they may have some hearings where they pull them in and they're all done in secret. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then we also know that uh, people who don't like secrecy are going to be saying, let's talk more about it. Uh, Let's do it in open session. I think we need, uh, starting very soon, open session hearings on the subject of UAP. And to me, that would be the greatest thing happening. That would be great. You know, it's it's, it's funny. It's like, to me and to someone like you, um, you know, it would be the most amazing thing ever and uh, that ever took place if we actually find out for certain that we are being visited by extraterrestrial. It's like a done deal. We know it and, and all that. Uh, there's yep. intelligent life out there, blah, blah, blah. And they are here, you know, that type of situation. But I think that, by the way, the problem of what we were just talking about, I don't want to give the impression I'm sitting on my hands saying, I can't wait for the government to finally come clean. First of all, governments don't tend to come clean, you know, in, in, a, in that way. Uh, and things have to happen before they come clean. So I'm not sitting around. The, I'm saying I would like the government to move a little closer to transparency and, and investigation mm-hmm. and do what they can do. But once that door is opened a little bit and that crack of light starts shining in, then we'll take it from there. You know, once, once we've admitted that something's going on, then academia can't s- say, well, we would never, you know, research this mm-hmm. because it's crazy. There can't be any UFOs. So we can't, you know, and, you know, I, I can't wait for, guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson to start taking credit and say, oh, I, I believed in UFOs all along. <laughs> you know? After all uh, the stuff he said. Gonna, yeah. yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's very funny that one of the favorite tweets I ever sent out is, I just got so ticked off at Neil deGrasse Tyson for, you know, he's doing the same thing Carl Sagan used to do, which is to argue that the universe is teeming with life, but they can't possibly be here. Right. And that, mm-hmm. I just find that to be outrageous. So one day he'd said something stupid about UFOs. And I put out a tweet that said, I declare Twitter war on Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> I never got more. I got that is what you have to do to get people to pay attention. My bit about let's go ask questions at town halls. That yeah. didn't fly. But Neil deGrasse Tyson, Twitter war that they liked. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, wow. Um, you know, uh, so I'm saying I was basically on, along the line of saying that you and I think that's important. There's a lot of people that do think that's important as far as, you know, looking into this topic. But do you think that there's enough people in the country? You mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people are going about their business and not really paying attention. Do you think that is what's going to hold it back is that it's not enough in front of the average person out there that's worried about their next paycheck or whatever it is, um, that, um, you know, their I think constituents... that's a separate track. Yeah, I, 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 because the thing is, it's this is the old a little bit pregnant thing. Uh, you really can't be a little bit pregnant. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't agree that UFOs are real a little bit. They either are or they aren't. It's a binary choice, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, it seems we have we are rapidly crossing the threshold where we say that uh, UAP is real. We just don't know what it is, uh, which is the equivalent of saying Trump did impeachable things, but they're not they're not worthy of him. He did things he shouldn't do, but they're not worthy of impeachment. You can always split the hair on anything, and the UFO hair is is what I just said. Um, so I I tend to think, um, yes. We have to always agree most people are more interested in their bills, uh, where they work, uh, their kids' soccer game. You know, they're, they're interested in life, and they should be interested in life. That's what makes us humans, okay? But it doesn't mean that the body politic or an individual can't hold another idea in their head at the same time. And that's what I'm arguing for, that... We need to get to the place where what disclosure is, is not this, oh, my God, we've just disclosed there's aliens, and now the whole system shuts down. That's not what we need. What we need is to say, well, I suspected that all along. I guess there are aliens, and I guess there's a few that have been here on Earth for a while. I guess we better start talking about that, right? And I'd uh, I'd like to watch some shows about that. I'd like to... I'd like to think that we can start having those kind of discussions. So I, 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 I don't think 
that UFO or UAP discussion will be prevented from going forward simply because uh, people are busy. I mean, I'm a busy guy. I think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. So do uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I get what you're saying there. It's, it's all very interesting here. I'm trying to uh, uh, open up here so we can get uh, the phone lines open. And uh, I think I can do that. I just want to make sure everyone is ready here. We have a screener uh, race over there at KGR Radio, KGRA Radio, and hopefully you're ready. Uh, you know, I just got sent the um, the headlines here from, it says, officials still puzzled. Let's see, this just came out 34 minutes ago, according to some of the Senate. Um, officials still puzzled about hovering object that prompted lockdown in D.C. Wow. Yeah, it's happening. Wow. <laughs> okay, you got to just read this because I'm. <laughs> That's all. I got to hear this. Yeah. That's all you got. That's all he, he sent a uh, screen capture. I, I can't get. I can't get to it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it could be fake. It could be fake news. <laughs> going online. Well, I'll keep talking. Yeah. I'm going to online. Why? This will be Bryce working on that. I'm, okay. I'm Googling Washington, D.C. Uh, yeah, lockdown, hovering object. But, uh, lockdown, hovering object. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so the lines are open. Um, and if you'd like to give a call, that number is 855-472-5483. Uh, and you are welcome to give us a call at that number. We have a race standing by to uh, screen the call over there. Thank you for doing that race. And uh, there it is. Yeah. Fox News. Not that I listen, I'm not I'm taking no. I'm just saying this is the first thing that showed up. It's not Bryce's. Please do not start the 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 uh, rumor that Zabel immediately turned to Fox News for his uh, <laughs> former CNN correspondent. I, you are <laughs> yeah, turns to Fox News. Anyway, here's what it says. Officials still puzzled about hovering object that prompted lockdown in D.C. Security officials on Capitol Hill are still puzzled by what sparked the security threat to be issued Tuesday morning that put both the White House and the Capitol on lockdown. Wow. Jets were scrambled. Officers warned people outside Capitol facilities to stay far away. U.S. Secret Service said personnel at the White House were told to remain in place. And here's a great quote. We don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> One security source told Fox News. <laughs> Officials, I love this. Officials said the alert could have been sparked by birds, a drone, <laughs> or possibly, and I love this, a, quote, weather anomaly, end oh, of quote. Weather balloon. You know, so the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. It's, uh, right? Yeah. It's a mogul. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have uh, Steve calling from Las Vegas. You're on the air, Steve. Thanks for the call. How are you? Uh, hi, Hi, Martin. Uh, hi, Bruce. Um, Bryce, Bryce is the name. Bryce. Skies. Yeah. Bryce, yeah. Uh, Dark Skies captivated me. Great, great series. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, I think it was about a year ago I read about they were going to do a remake of uh, Betty Barney Hill story. Yeah. And I think yeah. you were going to direct it or. Well, no. Uh, well, let me just bring you up to date on that's the captured project. And. Um, I've had, um, uh, I listen, I've been a giant Betty and Barney Hill case aficionado for a long time. Even as a kid, I remember reading about it, I think, in Look Magazine and, and just being blown away by it. Um, so, uh, because it always struck me, what makes it great is it, it's, uh, it was before people could have read about something and they faked it based on that. These are real authentic people. So I optioned the story captured um, that was written by Stanton Friedman and Kathy Marden. And um, it's been a long road. We've developed a screenplay out of it uh, that we're trying, that we, we have tried um, and are still trying to find the money to get it made in, in the vision that would be appropriate. But I'm also exploring something new right now, which is I'm developing it into a, a, 
a limited series, so it would be like eight episodes, which would give me time, I think, to tell the story in a more um, powerful way than just the, the two hours, which leaves so much out. Because I think what's great about Betty and Barney and their story is uh, how – it's also the story of their marriage. I mean, think about it. They're newly married. They're coming back from a honeymoon. And what happens? They get abducted by aliens. I mean, that's a buzzkill on a marriage, right? That makes it a little bit harder. So I'm I'm still very interested. And so um, the answer is, yes, we hope to find a home for this as soon as possible. Love for it to happen in 2020. Um, I will not probably be the director of it. I hope to be the writer of it. I'm certainly that's certainly the plan. Uh, but in any case, I'll produce and uh, try to find a great director for it. Because I, I think I think one of the things that we want to do in any project that has to do with the Betty and Barney Hill story is we want to take you on board that ship in a way that you've never been before. So we want to mm-hmm. give you a kind of an authentic feeling for what Betty and Barney claimed happened to them. So, anyway, uh, and, thanks uh, for staying with question. it, keeping at it. Oh, yeah. yes, uh, I was just waiting. Um, would you consider uh, making a, a, writing a screenplay for maybe Travis Walton? He wants to do a remake of his Fire in the Sky. He's not very happy the way the movie was made. Would you do something like that, hook up with him and uh, for write a screenplay for the big screen huh? and be real, real, realistic and show the frightness of... Because to me, that that abduction is scary. I mean, I want it to is. see that on the screen to capture that. Well, you know, and you raise a great point. First of all, I do know Travis, and I think his case is a brilliant one, and and um, and, and it's different than the Betty and Barney one. I think I've got a my current focus is to tell Betty and Barney's story uh, because it would be hard for me to not only have to try. You know, at this point. I need to tell Betty and Barney because that's the one that needs to be done. The Travis story is a great story. And in fact, as you know, Fire in the Sky was criticized by some because Tracy Torme, the writer, was sort of forced by the studio to jazz up what happened inside the ship in a way that wasn't exactly uh, based on how Travis described it. So there is some cleanup work to be done in a new, new, new film. But I will say lots of people like Fire in the Sky just fine the way it is. They don't care that it was uh, 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 embellished, if you will, mm-hmm. inside the, the ship. But that illustrates the point that we were talking about earlier, which is to a lot of people in Hollywood who are on the executive side of the table, they would look at the Travis Walton case or even my Betty and Barney Hill case and say, well, you know, I, I know that he described it this way, but I think it needs to have something else. And from their point of view, it's like, well, it's all fake anyway. So why can't you just make up something else? Whereas those of us who have studied the issue are like, no, no, it's not fake. And Travis Walton is an excellent witness. And this is what Travis Walton described. So yeah, I'd be very open. I'd love it. I mean, I wish somebody would come to me and say, hey, I want you to write the Travis Walton case. And here's the only thing I can say is success begets success in Hollywood. So if I'm lucky enough to make Betty and Barney, somebody may come to me or I may come to them and say, now that we've done the Betty and Barney story, let's do Travis Walton. So for example, if I did the miniseries and did Betty and Barney one year, I'd love to do Travis Walton in the second season. Ah. As an example. Yeah. Um, I just hung up on Steve. Sorry about that, Steve, by accident. I, My mouse kind of just... Thanks went. for calling, Steve. Yeah, thanks for the call. And the line is open. Again, that number is 855-472-5483. Uh, um, speaking of, uh, you talked about earlier that um, you used, um, you brought in Majestic 12 and into the particle collider there. Um, what a, What do you think about MJ12. I have I've not only been on the fence. I've kind of doubt that the documents were real. But I, uh, what do you think in general? Do you think there was a some type of MJ12 out there? If not that in particular? Well, that's the position I've always taken from a, a, a writing point of view. My my, do, do I know if documents are real or not? Uh, do I know if Majestic 12 existed or not? I'm just one guy trying to do the best he can, so I, I can't answer that in, in a definitive uh, way. But I will say this. I do believe 
that if Roswell is a true event, and I believe it is and was, then that means the government would clearly have done something like Majestic 12. It wouldn't have been... I, I think today the UFO management, the UAP management, may be as much private enterprise as it was government, as it is government. Uh, but I believe back in 1947, it clearly would have been a governmentally inspired organization. So I, I in Dark Skies, we called it Majestic 12. Um, and I do know that our friend Stan Friedman passionately believed until his dying days um, that Majestic 12 was a real thing. Yes. He's the guy mm -hmm. that that uh, followed through on those documents as no one had ever done. Um, and I think it's possible of the, all the documents that have been released, it's possible that that Eisenhower briefing memo is either true or is, you know, we just live in a topsy-turvy world, and it makes me angry that the people who have had this information have forced us into the situation where we have to have discussions like this, because it's ridiculous. That, that memo, if it was real, should have been released long ago, and we shouldn't be having to ask ourselves on a podcast, do we think it's real or not? Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think something was real. It's possible, with disinformation being what it is, that somebody literally wrote a memo that is like 80% real and released it just to see what would happen. Uh, so I don't really know, but I believe that the UFO management, I don't call it a cover-up at this point, I just call it management. The management of the UFO issue, I believe, from the very beginning, started out in the government, and then over the 70 years that it's been in in place, has morphed a little bit to be at least 50-50 government and private enterprise. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things, I had uh, Chris Mellon on a lot, you know, a couple, I don't know, three years ago. And one of the things um, he mentioned was that if it was in, uh, up involved in a private enterprise, then there would never be, uh, it would be uh, um, basically bulletproof from congressional hearings or anything like that, you know, to get that thing off, to get that well, part of it off into the private sector. Which explains why you have... Uh, Congress people and and people even in the military who goes yeah I think we should look into this and you'd like your part of you wants to say you should look into it you don't know I mean come on uh, except I do think that this seventy years has created one of the most ridiculous scenarios around which is even the people who think they know or should know don't know everything that they know and sometimes they don't know anything so. It's it's really, we've got this bizarre, blind-leading-the-blind scenario going on, and I think we're all tired of it. I think, as a society, we're tired of it. I'm exhausted from it. <laughs> I want it to be over. Mm -hmm. And I want to move on to the next phase. Phase one was denial and ridicule. I, when they put it into place in 1947, they probably thought it would last five years or less. And they were just buying time. And what they didn't realize is how incredibly successful denial and ridicule would be as a policy. And it's worked 70 years. And, but it was still phase one. Phase two is, let's talk about this. So I'm ready for phase two. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, yeah, we're, very, we're as close to that as we've ever been, that's for sure. Um, the line's open. Uh, again, that number is uh, 855-472-5483. Bryce, you said that you are working or I don't know if you said you're working on a book or you're starting a book on the Trail of Saucers. Is that what it's called, something like right. that? I am uh, starting um, working on a new book uh, because sometimes this is just how I work out my – you know, I, I, I like screenwriting, uh, and it's and it's been my life and my career. Um I like television, I like movies, but sometimes there's something fun about writing a book because you don't get notes, right? Any any movie I write or any television episode I write, I get notes from people. Sometimes they're good notes, sometimes they're bad notes, but you get notes where other people tell you what you should do with your work. So writing a book yeah. is a clean, wonderful thing for a writer to do. And I've noticed that you know, I've lived a, a, a pretty public life on this topic. So I'm writing a book called On the Trail of the Saucers, all right? And uh, it's, it's really, I'm trying to bring my thoughts 
and my conclusions or theories or whatever into kind of a journalistic road trip, if you will, <laughs> through through these projects I've worked on and what I learned in, in each one and why I came to believe the things and weave in all these different things. And I, I, I just realized I've just had a lot of personal stories that were impacted on this topic. I've, you know, worked with Steven Spielberg on UFOs. I've had, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I worked on Taken. I, you know, I, I had, uh, and, and, and again, I, one of the things I'll be writing about is uh, Spielberg and uh, and Barry Sonnenfeld, the director of uh, MIB, tried to kill Dark Skies uh, because we had Men in Black. So um, I had some crazy, crazy stuff. And then again, as I said, the Office of Naval Intelligence or at least guys who said they were from there, came to and crashed our Dark Skies premiere party and uh, said they wanted to help us with the show. So things like that. Um, I wrote a movie, Official Denial, that was about UFOs being us from the future. And I think that was one of the first times I ever saw that floated. So I've, I've had an interesting time, and I'm, I'm going to write about it again. Um, yeah. I, because the book I wrote with Dolan... Um, was a, a, a sober, uh, you know, 35,000 foot look at the, the thing with a good friend, Dolan, whereas this one is, is me. It's just going to be what I'm, I'm thinking, what, I'm, what, what conclusions I've drawn. Well, as a filmmaker, I'll ask you this question. What if all these UFO sightings is that we are an experiment and part of a reality TV show for, <laughs> for extraterrestrials? <laughs> well, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, I mean, it, it may be crazy to put it in reality TV, but let's say that you were, first of all, again, let's just step, stipulate, we don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> we don't know why they're here. We don't know how they think. We don't know who they are. We don't know how many of them there are. We don't know whether they're still here or just coming. We don't know if we're on some kind of Greyhound bus stop uh, through the universe. We don't know. But um, I think what we... Um, we do know is that um, it's a gnarly situation and we are struggling to understand uh, what what they would want. And one of the things they might want is our very humanity. We always act, here's what I would say. <clears throat> the only thing I ever actually argued with Stanton Friedman about, Stan always would sort of make those asides where he'd go, who would want to, you know, I mean, he would act like we're just a bunch of crazy humans. Why would anyone Tribal. want to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? And he would make that argument. And I said, Stan, I just don't buy that. And he said, why? And I said, my take is different. My take is pretty simple premise, that all intelligent life is interesting to other intelligent life, hmm. right? Now, let's just think about it. If that's true, that would explain why they're here. You know, if we found another intelligent, if we found any life, if we found a spider on Mars, <coughs> we'd put it on the cover of Time. Mm -hmm. It would be the biggest thing around. If we found an intelligent spider on Mars, we'd want to talk to it, right? So I don't think that it's impossible to believe that intelligent life wants to see other intelligent life. And that might explain why they're here. So now to take your reality show analogy it is not impossible that an extremely evolved species um, has lost a few things along the way and one of the things they may have lost is that personal quality that humans have in abundance so that was one of the themes of dark skies that the the creatures who had come here uh, were part of a hive and a group think mind and so one of wow. the things they found so fascinating about humanity is we were pretty flawed but we had you know, billions of independent minds at work, whereas they had one mind at work with billions of species involved in it. And so, I, and that's just, you know, that I don't, I don't have any reason to believe that. It was just part of our, our, our development. But I think that the truth, when we know it, will blow our minds. Wow. So you could be right. Wow. Like a swarm intelligence is what I've heard that yeah. uh, called. Um, now, I'd like to get back to something you said earlier you said at a party i believe you said that it was kind of yeah. crashed by intelligence officers or yeah. people claiming yeah. to be so how yeah. did that what happened with that well this is a longer story so i'm going to tell you the short version but and you'll understand why it's part of a book 
Okay, <laughs> it's going to be okay. because Brent, my partner, and I have uh, decided that it's you know 2020 coming up, and for us to have this experience and not lay all the facts out seems wrong. So we're we're going to be talking more about it. Here's what happened: um, when Dark Skies was completed and uh, it had not aired yet. We had a premiere party for the night that it, it, it aired. It was like September 21st of that year. And um, so nobody had seen it. It was literally, we had 200 people at my house, okay, here in Southern California. They were cast and crew. And during this party, all of us had little magic, Majestic 12 badges, right, <laughs> which were made by the props department. So you literally, if you were on the list, got your badge. So suddenly there's this guy in my backyard, a guy in khakis and a blue blazer, and he doesn't have a badge. He's the only guy without a badge. <laughs> and I don't know who he is, and neither does Brent. And he introduces himself uh, as JC, and he tells us that he's with Naval Intelligence and that they thought we did a pretty good job with our show. And okay. I'm like, nobody has seen our show. And he goes, well, <laughs> yeah. And he proceeded to tell us... Um, uh, that they thought that we were right on a lot of things, but that we had a few things wrong and they wanted to give us a little help and they thought that we should accept this. Well, I didn't know whether this guy was real, not real or whatever. And I did think it was crazy. Somebody had crashed my house party. And I, I basically said, I don't have, I'm hosting a party. I don't have time to talk about this right now. But Brent talked to him a little bit longer. The guy um, basically wrote something on a napkin that looked like an equation, and he said, this is what it's all about. Uh, and we said, what? And he said, sound, light, and frequency. Okay, mm -hmm. now I don't know what that means in the context. Anyway, party ends, all right? There's a lot more to it. Won't bore you with all those details. The guy calls up Brent the next week and says, I take it your partner was unimpressed with us, which meaning me. I said, And he said, so... Um, maybe you want to meet my boss. Brent says, sure. So this guy comes in with an older guy to our Dark Skies offices, clear security. We put him in the conference room. These guys do not look like fanboys. They're not like, they're not like the guy in the basement uh, doing anything. These are Navy SEAL quality, hard body, tough guys. And the guy he brings treats me with disdain. He's like, I can't even believe I have to go talk to this guy, <laughs> right? But they lay out what they call the story of contact, you know, over a couple of hours. And at this point, I said, you know, I I appreciate that you came here, but I'm I'm trying to put a television show on the air, and I don't think my employers would be very happy if I spent the day talking to you in this conference room when you won't even uh, prove to me who you are. So this meeting is over. And uh, so I left again, right? So it happened one more time. <laughs> they contacted Brent and said, your partner seems like kind of a, like he's just really not with the program here. So maybe he wants to meet the main guy. And I, now this is going to sound crazy. It is crazy, but this is God's truth what happened. Brent said, well, what, how would that work? And they said, look, there's a ship down at Long Beach, and he's on it. And he'll meet you guys this weekend. And Brent said, okay, where and when? And this is the part that you're just not going to believe, but it's true. He said, um, we'll meet you at a cemetery at midnight. <laughs> okay? Uh -huh. And I said... When Brent told me that, I go, I have three children. I am meeting no one at a cemetery at midnight. And that's the last I ever heard of these guys. Wow. Wow. Makes you wonder, though, huh? I mean, that's that's pretty interesting. But that's a well, strange place to meet. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that is it, bizarre. I, it happened, for sure. Yeah. And the only thing I will tell you is prior to that, Brent's neighbor, when he was growing up, became the undersecretary of the Navy in Reagan's first term and became the energy secretary in Reagan's second term. Okay? And he told Brent stories about being briefed at an underground facility about extraterrestrials. Wow. Uh, and, and So we're going to write, a, I'm going to write yeah. about all that in this book because I, I get asked, you know, and I can't do justice to it just 
you know, sure. between the two of us. And it and when it's broken down to its component pieces, it sounds a little fantastical. And and it certainly was, but it happened. Hmm. And so. and in fact, because we met those guys. Um, or no, not because we met those guys, but because of Brent's contact with his his uh, neighbor growing up. We didn't make our cover up group that ran Majestic Twelve, the Air Force. We made it O and I. We made it Navy that was running it. So wow. now, when I see the Navy in these current reports, you know, coming forward and being the most uh, open about this topic, makes perfect sense to me. Did you ever ask anyone in the studio if they perhaps had shown? either a clip or given a reel to these people to watch? I mean, how did they know what type of job you were doing? I mean, Well, they certainly knew. Uh, they had seen it. I mean, yeah. we discussed it. At, at my party, when no one in the world had seen it, I thought, except for those of us who made it. But the thing is, I mean, I can't tell you that, of course, people had seen it. You know, I mean, of course, the network and the studio had, on a very tight rein, let certain people see it. Like a I mean, screener, it wasn't a so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a, a top secret. I mean, the the um, the reviewers had all seen a copy of it. But what was weird is a guy who's not a reviewer and not part of, not a friend of the studio or the network or whatever, to literally tell me scene by scene what's in my program, and it hasn't aired, hmm. and to have found out about my party, and snuck into my party and be in my backyard. I mean, these were just weird things. And to know where you lived and, you know, all that stuff. That freaked me out. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, it just freaked me out. I don't like people I don't know knowing that. Yeah, just showing up like that. Yeah, that's that's. It was a long time ago. Hasn't happened. You know, I mean, you know, to the extent that we had a usefulness, it, it, it passed. You know, mm-hmm. I, I did take out um, uh, for lunch David O'Leary, who uh, runs yeah. Blue Book. I think I got it connected <laughs> you to, right? Didn't I connect yeah, you to guys? Yeah, maybe you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Thank right. you, my friend. So we had we had lunch, and I, I told him this story, and I said, anybody ever contact you? And he goes, no, not so far, but when they do, I'm calling you. So, <laughs> I mean, who knows? I mean, who knows? Yeah, and I think uh, another series is uh, the season two is coming out. Um, I yeah. saw something on that. So, uh, yeah. uh, have you worked I mean, with him at all on, it, on that, or just no, you just? No, I haven't. Just, and 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 listen, I understand what they're doing with the blue book, and I don't want to be a rain on anybody's parade kind of thing. But for me, it's it's kind of weird because I know so much about Alan Hynek. Uh, Don Schmidt, whose who's life story I have under option, uh, worked for Alan Hynek, right, right? Yeah. and tells the story about Hynek literally on his deathbed saying, why won't they tell me even now? Hmm. So if you know that's how Hynek felt at the end of his life, the idea that the television series now portrays him as seeing bodies and crashes and being at Roswell and all, yeah. you know, that's not... It would almost be better if it was a fictional character, because Alan Hynek certainly was not that guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I talked to uh, his son, uh, Paul, um, yeah. f- you know, a few months ago in Phoenix, and basically asked him how he felt about all that, um, because he's he's there. He's a, one of the consultants on the show, and they, yeah. do, they do run things by him. And, you know, there was one, he said he only had one objection, and he stood really hard to it, and that was that his... Uh, his father was supposed to say something as it, as in scientific fact, and he says, "No, you can't do that." Uh, that's the only time he really put his foot down. And there's they've really taken a lot of license with. Uh, that's some of the pretty things. shocking. That's the only thing that bothered him. I mean, no, no, other wow. things, other things he did say yeah. did bother him, but that one he put his foot down. Um, you know, yeah, I mean the way they portrayed his mother and, um, you know. Things like that. Listen, no. you're, you know, I don't. I'm sort of the pot calling the kettle black. I support the show. I think what I think David O'Leary is a great guy. Yes. And the people who are running it are smart, and it's beautifully shot and wonderfully acted, and you know, there's just a lot of great things with about all that. it. Yeah. So I I don't want to be the guy because uh, let's face it, you have to take dramatic license. I have a number of projects, not all of them UFO projects. I have a big feature film that's going to be shooting next year in Europe about the last battle of World War II in Europe. It's a true story, and I wrote the screenplay for it, 
But I will say I've had to take dramatic license on it. That just goes with the territory. And I always say to people, um, you know, if you uh, if you think too much too much dramatic license has been taken, go read a book, or you know, read the underlying book, or go watch a documentary about whatever it is, um, because the object of a film or a television series is primarily to entertain. So that's right. I don't yeah. want to be too much of a hard ass about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Um, I think everything you just said about that. Um, I think it's a wonderful uh, set. Uh, the, the filming is great, and whoever does, uh, I know there's a, I can't remember the exactly the exact term of it, but there's someone that wants to make sure everything's period of the time. Right. Uh, and I'm I'm really I'm not an easy person to watch any type of uh, film like that with, because I I pay attention to everything, and uh, they do an excellent job with getting period uh, furniture you know, furnishings oh, yeah. in there and uh, props. I mean, a blue book actually feels a very lot to me like dark skies because uh. they're both period UFO pieces. You know, right. they're set, there's a set in the fifties. Ours was set in the sixties. They're inside blue book. We are inside majestic 12. I mean, they're very similar, uh, in that regard. So, um, I, you know, who am I not to like it? I, I just, it's, I really, it's just the Heineck issue. Right. Right. Um, someone has tried to call my Skype, whoever it is. Uh, please call the number that's on the screen instead, and that number is 855-472-5483. Um, and it looks like that person may be calling uh, now. Uh, we'll take that call as soon as that is screened. And it is, uh, I think it's Dave. Hey, can I, as while yeah. we're waiting, can I just throw a couple of things yeah, out go there? Right ahead. people sure. always ask. Um, if anyone wants to follow my UFO vibe on Twitter, uh, my my handle is at Hollywood UFOs, at Hollywood UFOs. And I also have a website that I put together where I'm sort of exploring some of these early thoughts. It's called whatifufos.com. Uh, so whatifufos.com. And, uh, you know, we haven't touched on it, but the other two books I've written have been um, alternate history books. Uh, one of them is called... Uh, Surrounded by Enemies, What If Kennedy Survived Dallas? And the other is Once There Was a Way, What If the Beatles Stayed Together? So I kind of love the alternate history thing. And uh, there's a couple of, the, you know, what if jfk.com and what if beatles.com. So now well, you've got all the Bryce URLs and your, your caller may be on the line. Yeah, they're on the line, but the, I'm waiting for the screener to get done talking. He's talking to him. Um, I love alternate history. Uh, pieces I really really do and uh, uh, I remember you and I had talked about this previously um, on the line from Florida we have Dave Altman how are you Dave hey Martin how are you good good thanks for the call how you're on with Bryce uh, I'm sorry yeah, we we're bashing but, something you yeah, were uh, hey, hey Bryce yeah hey Dave you have some involvement with uh, sorry, Project Martin, what was that? I said we were bashing something you have some involvement with I'm sorry about that <laughs> Oh no! It wasn't you? It wasn't you. Uh, there were some people in the chat room that were uh, saying that one of my clients is really hot, and I just joked about it. And I said, "Easy now! I, I work with uh, some of those blue book people." So, <laughs> oh yes, it was um, funny. You're talking about the blonde Russian lady on the Project Blue Book, is your client? Yeah, Ksenia yeah. Ksenia Solo. Yeah, is her name? Yes, beautiful girl. Yes. Which is ironic because yeah, in the yeah. middle, of, middle of Dark Skies' this first season, we brought in a hot Russian agent who was <laughs> Jerry Ryan, who became seven of nine and was a hot mm -hmm. blonde. Uh, the network just thought we needed more hot blondes on the show. So, and, and Jerry walked in and just nailed the uh, audition. And so she, that before she became seven of nine, she was a Russian agent. Yeah, I remember. And what a lot of people don't know is that Ksenia, is, you know, she is Russian and that's that's right. her real, you know, I mean, she obviously speaks perfect English, but her, you know, her Russian is spot on, you know, makes her even sexier. Right. <laughs> hey, did you have a, did you have a question for um, Bryce in particular? Well, I just wanted to call and say, you know, happy Thanksgiving to you and yeah, just tell you. race happy Thanksgiving and, and everybody else happy holidays if I don't talk to you and uh, wanted to say hello and, and meet Bryce and maybe we'll talk soon. Thanks, right. so, thanks for your call. Appreciate it. 
Hey, Dave, uh, thanks a lot. All right, guys. Take Hap care. Happy Thanksgiving. All right. Um, yeah, so that line is open again, and we have about nine minutes left to the show. So if anyone wants to call in, it's best to call in the next five minutes or so, and that's 855-472-5483. Um, are, there, are they running uh, replays, Bryce, of Dark Skies anywhere? You know, interestingly, uh, no. Uh, it, and a lot of it had to do with our music clearance. Uh, we had so oh. much period music in it that uh, that's been a, a thorn in the side. So actually, it remains to this day the best way to see Dark Skies is there is a excellent DVD set that was put together. I worked for months with the... Uh, the Shout Factory people trying to get it together. They did four hours of documentary on Dark Skies. They put in wow. um, all kinds of uh, Easter eggs, and uh, and I gave them everything I owned and and put it in there. So it's it's um it's a it's a great DVD set. Uh, it's just fantastic. I I and and here's something that's for film school students. This is pretty interesting. I told you that Spielberg and um, Sonnenfeld from MIB uh, had a problem because they were at Sony, we were at Sony, and they we were editing next to each other, and they saw that we had all these men in black, and they they got freaked out, and um, and so the studio said, well, let me just put it this way because this I'm going to write about more in my book too, but this really happened too. I got a, a studio executive that said, get your guys out of the black suits, and I said. That's bullshit. Excuse me. Can I say that? You uh, you that. You're not really supposed to say bullshit on the show, but anyway. Go God, ahead. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but it was, and I, I started explaining how Men in Black go back to the 50s and, and, you know, and how I'd written about them already for Lois and Clark, and I had Men in Black and Official Denial, and everyone else had known about Men in Black, and I said all this, and the executive said, stay where you are, I'm coming down. So this executive from Columbia Television, uh, which is now Sony, comes down to the set, takes me aside, and says words that still chill me to this day to say out loud. He takes me aside and he goes, let me make this clear to you. Get your guys out of the black suits today or we will shut down your production and burn your negative. Isn't Try having something? those words say to you. Okay, so yeah. So and just another crazy thing that, that happened, and you'd, you'd say to yourself, well, why would anyone do that? So anyway, what, what I was saying about the DVD set, so what happened is Spielberg's and company presented us with 19 non-negotiable demands of things we had to reshoot. We couldn't have an elevator because they had an elevator. Uh. We couldn't say, I'm a figment of your imagination because they wanted to say it things like that. So we had to reshoot all these scenes uh, and we had to take everybody out of their black suits, right? So wow. here's what's great. The, the piece, the pre-Spielberg interference piece got edited and released in Europe. The Spielberg interference piece got aired and released in NBC and the DVD set has both versions on it. Wow. So you can actually watch this two-hour pilot, and you can see the version that was made before it was messed with, and then you can see the broadcast version. Wow. It's fascinating to watch. Isn't that something? So you, you think the series will never actually go back on the air because of royalty I issues or something? No, no. I mean, I, I, somebody has to figure out that music was an issue why the DVD set took forever, and finally they figured it out in 2011 and put it out. Um and I think that there may be issues about that with streaming, but I doubt it. I, personally, I think the re it's inevitable it will stream. And if, frankly, if anybody wanted it to stream, they should start writing streamers and telling them that they'd like to see it stream. I would be thrilled if, if it did. Um, but, you know, I don't control that. I don't own it, and I don't control it. So I can't do that. Hmm. Um, yeah. Going back... <clears throat> Uh, going back to what we were talking a minute ago about the alternate realities, is that um, yeah. is that something alternate history type of thing? Is that is that something you're um, still is that still a topic that you really enjoy in your life? Absolutely. Yeah. Have you thought <laughs> yeah, of another I mean, uh, another subject? Yeah. The top uh, the book series that I've got is called Breakpoint, 
sort of the break point in history where could have gone this way, Kennedy could have died, or Kennedy could have lived, that kind of thing. And by the way, both of my first two books, the ones about the first one about Kennedy surviving Dallas and the second one about the Beatles staying together, both won the Sidewise Award for Alternate History, which is mm. kind of a big deal. I mean, uh, Philip Roth won it. I mean, it was a big deal. So I'm, I'm having success with it, so I'm going to continue to write them. Right now, I'm trying to set Breakpoint up as a limited, well, not a limited series, but a, a series where uh, each season we would do one of the books. So the first season would be the JFK season, second season would be the Beatles, third season would be to be determined. Um, I still haven't decided which the third book will be. Um, now, when you're doing the show like, uh, for instance, uh, Kennedy, um, yeah. if he had survived, um, you must come up with some amazing scenarios of things that how have happened did you come up with um ideas and then that y you thought could happen but were a little too risky or how did that you know what i tried to do with both of them i tried to make them feel authentic mm -hmm. so that so that people would read it and i've gotten this response if you look on amazon for both of the books you see a lot of notes from people where they go i had to stop and you know check Wikipedia or something to figure out <laughs> if what I was reading really happened or it was something that wow. he made up for the book because I tried to make it feel authentic. So in other words, um, my Beatles book is not about somebody going back in time to save John Lennon, right? Mm -hmm. Mine is just a history where there's a break point and my break point in the Beatles book, for example, happens in 1968 when the John and Paul appeared on The Tonight Show. That's my break point for that one. My break point for JFK is he doesn't he gets shot at in Dallas, but they don't but they miss. And what mm -hmm. would happen then? And here's and, and when I try to find the the intriguing little uh complications. So for JFK, for example, if the guy doesn't get killed in Dallas, it doesn't mean somebody didn't try to shoot him. I mean, I don't think Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, which means that Bob uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy and Jack Kennedy would have become the first conspiracy theorists. They'd have gone back to Washington, D.C. on November 23rd and knowing damn well it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone, and they would have said, we have to fight back. So, really, it's a fight between the Kennedy brothers and the conspiracy, and it feels very authentic and real, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, wow. It's called Surrounded by Enemies. Wow. And the Beatles one is called Once There Was a Way. Yeah, I love that. Um, we're going to take a quick call because we only have a minute. Uh, real quickly, uh, Andy, we have a real short, uh, a real short question for our guest, don't you? Sure. Just uh, was wondering if Bryce had heard of uh, Dan Aykroyd's uh, encounter with uh, uh, Men in Black or studio kind of intimidation uh, in his experience with his show. Um, and I'll, I'll take your uh, answer off there. Thank, thanks again, guys. Thank, thanks, Bye -bye. Andy. Thank you. Uh, I've met Dan Aykroyd. I met him a couple of years ago right when the uh, New York Times article was breaking. Um, he told me that story. Um, also, uh, Dan sent me a letter of intent. He would like to play the psychiatrist Benjamin Simon in the Betty and Barney Hill story. Oh, my God. And so so I'm I'm taking that very seriously. I think Dan is a very, very well-regarded and well-read person on this topic. Yes. I'd be delighted to have him uh, play Benjamin Simon. I think he'd do a fantastic job. So, yeah, I'm a big Dan Aykroyd fan. And I, Me too. I, yeah. I think he's terrific, and um, he he's had some experiences. And he his has. experiences are not all just drinking his tequila. That's some right. of them are pretty yeah. crazy UFO ones. He's had four sightings. Bryce, we are totally out of time, I'm sorry to say, and uh, thank you so much. I want to have you back on again because it was that that good, so thank you so oh, much. My pleasure. Thanks, and goodbye, everyone. All right, goodbye. All right, everyone, so that is it for our show tonight. Thanks so much. I know we have to run real quickly, and uh, next week we'll be back um, with Chris Lambright. And again, thank you so much for listening to the show, and remember to keep your eyes to the sky.